Right, okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so we're continuing on with print periods. Now we're focusing on the Big Five model. Um, probably your came across the Big Five before, but hopefully we'll talk about it in more detail than you've done so before. Um, so if you remember to using the, um, the acronym Ocean or Canoe, I'll, I'll give you the gist of them now, but I'll talk about each of them individually in more detail. Uh, so, you know, Costa and McCree are the two often given credit for this um, because they came up with the way of measuring the Big Five that was high in internal consistency and high in stability. But as we want to see, they weren't the first um, to discover the Big Five. Uh, there were several before them who did so. Um, but openness is the tendency to be curious and unconventional. So remember, these are not five traits. These are five factors that emerge through factor analysis. Okay, so each of these five factors or dimension contain numerous characteristics that all load together and correlate strongly. So opening up the filter of being curious, unconventional, and um, novelty seeking, okay, it also corresponds with creativity and intelligence. Now the association there may be not too surprising because <laughs> there's an association between creativity and intelligence. Depending upon which definition you use, you can use uh, you know, a broader definition of creativity, which is that you have some sort of creative pursuit or that you're capable of this, in which case everyone would be at least somewhat creative. But a narrower definition of creativity would be coming up with original ideas or creative achievement and doing something that other people haven't done before, which requires a, you know, a degree of intelligence. Um, but also people high in openness you know they're looking to experience new things. They're high in novelty. They want to experience new cultures, go to new countries, try different food items on the menu. Um, they get a dopamine kick from experiencing novelty, okay? Whereas their mood is likely to be impacted by the environment in terms of how aesthetically pleasing it is, okay? Someone who is high in openness will you know, feel somewhat depressed if they're in an environment that's planned. And if they're constantly having to do the same thing that's familiar and it becomes routine, because this novelty is what energizes them. And also someone who is high in openness is interested in ideas and they're motivated by pursuing that which intrinsically they're interested in. So, you know, whether it's the latest thing that they just read about that they're interested in, or whether it's philosophy or history or politics, or whether it's the latest movie that they just watched that they loved, or the latest read book that they just read. But they will frame conversations around this. This is what they want to talk about, which what they're interested in. And conscientiousness, you know, traits such as being organized, disciplined, orderly, okay? It can be broken down really into those that are to do with orderliness and those to do with industriousness. So we know a fair bit about orderliness, okay? It corresponds with discussed sensitivity. So um, someone who is high in orderliness, you no, know, they'll be more disgusted by a messy room and they'll want to clean it up. But also they're more disgusted by, for example, revolting smells or re revolting images, but also they're more disgusted by moral transgressions as well. So this corresponds to kind of social situations. Uh, we know less about industriousness, and I'll come to talk about that more, but you know, industriousness is to do with being hardworking, always wanting to be on the go, wanting to use your time productively. <clears throat> Um, and then extraversion, of course, a term used by Jung, but we're broadening the definition now. So yes, it's to do with um, how you're energized in terms of how much you enjoy socializing. Does this energize you or does it exhaust you? But also with the extent to which you experience enthusiasm and positive emotion, how socially assertive you are. Um, and then agreeableness is made up of <clears throat> traits such as being sympathetic, Cooperative, compliant, polite, altruistic, compassionate, high in empathy. But people who are high in agreeableness mm -hmm. find conflict adverse, okay? It's physically uncomfortable for them. They, you know, they always want to be pleasing others, and that's how they make their decisions. They don't uh, think about themselves so much. They're self-sacrificing. And, uh, you know, so you can probably think of people who might score highly in this, who, you know, want to avoid arguments at all costs and will want to please others. and aren't very argumentative. 
And then at the low end, you can probably think of other extremes, people who always want their way and are always ready for a fight and are always ready for an argument and will never shy away from saying exactly what they want and being direct. But you probably don't know many people at extremes, okay, because most people are near the middle. These are normal distributions. Very few people are at the extreme edges. Most people are somewhere near the middle of the distribution. <clears throat> and then neuroticism is your propensity for experiencing negative emotion. Okay, so these negative emotions correlate with one another. And how likely you are to be anxious and depressed, how likely you are to be irritable, um, but also how likely you are to be frustrated, envious. Um, pretty much all negative emotions correlate with one another, except disgust. Disgust is not associated with neuroticism, it's associated with conscientiousness. And pretty much all of the other negative emotions correspond with one another. <clears throat> and a big plus of the big five is that it's highly replicable. Okay, as we'll go on to see, it's been found in study after study, various samples, various questionnaires, various methods, and for factor analysis, these five factors continue to emerge. <clears throat> And this is true also for um, other cultures. So there's cross-cultural support for the validity of the Big Five. When we translate the questionnaires into various other languages and we look for the existence of the Big Five um, in other cultures, we find them. When we use personality questionnaires in other cultures and then put the results for factor analysis, again, the five factors emerge for factor analysis. <clears throat> So, you know, the big five, um, in many ways, is a crowning achievement of personality research, right? It took a long time to get there, and it was just the result of about 100 years of research. It wasn't the case that anyone predicted those would be the five core elements of personality. No one predicted that there would be five, okay? This wasn't based upon theory. It was just the case that it emerged through analysis, and it did so again and again over a period of decades. So Fisk was likely the first in 1949, to identify the big five. And then in 61, Chips and Crystal found the same five when looking at eight different samples, one of which was graduate students, one of which was Air Force personnel. And but across these samples, they were seeing the existence of these five factors. And in 96, Lossier and Goldberg, two better known psychologists who are often given credit for this um, study, in which there was 1,000 participants all completing a personality questionnaire. And again, through factor analysis, these five factors emerge. But what's also very impressive about the Big Five is when we have questionnaires not even designed to measure the Big Five, okay, just maybe a list of adjectives and, you know, they're just one word items, they're not questions, and we ask participants to rate to what extent this word applies to you, for example, on a score of one to five, and we put those results through factor analysis, then again, we find the Big Five through factor analysis, okay, and dozens of studies have done this using just one word items rather than questions. But also if we take items from various other questionnaires designed to measure separate constructs, and then we undergo all of those results for factor analysis, again, we can find the five factors emerging for factor analysis. So Raymond Cattell 16 personality factor questionnaire, you know, all of these can be loaded into five factors for factor analysis. And we haven't looked at Hans Isaac's theory yet um, because his model is very rooted in biological theory, so we'll come back to the biological chapter, but his model existed between Cattell and the emergence of the Big Five, but his factors also can be um, subsumed by the Big Five. Temperament scales also correspond to the five factors. Anxiety questionnaires, those, those items load on to neuroticism, um, and then other questionnaires as well, like interpersonal problems. Okay. Oh, no. When we look at multiple questionnaires, again, the items can be loaded onto five factors. <clears throat> and a little bit about the researchers. Costa, born in New Hampshire, 1942. Undergrad undergraduate at Clark, both masters of PhD in human development from Chicago. PhD in 1970, um, worked after that at Harvard and then at Mass Massachusetts, Boston, which is where he met McRae. Um, and McRae, undergrad at Michigan State, graduate at Boston. And then there he became interested in the work by Raymond Cattell. So he was then interested in personality research and in factor analysis. 
Uh, four years into his PhD is when his life changed, if you like, when he met Paul Costa. And then together they began working on personality studies. And since then they've published together over 200 um, studies um, looking at chorus correspondences between personality and particular outcomes using the big five. Um, and ultimately written several books together and like they really revolutionized how we um, measure personality because they came up with a questionnaire that had an extremely high internal consistency and extremely high stability. So it was very, very reliable. And this was a big reason also as to why the big five then became popular in personality research. Yeah, I've chosen um, a lot of friends who I think would score highest in these dimensions, okay, just to kind of illustrate some of the characteristics. You know, so if we gave the six friends the big five, I think Phoebe would score highest in openness. Um, you know, she's one who's creative, likes to play guitar, looking for creative um, pursuits. But also a big part of openness is divergent thinking, meaning that you can hold multiple ideas at the same time and then come across quite scatterbrained. Um, Monica, certainly high in conscientiousness, right? She's very orderly, has some what OCD tendencies, wants to keep um, an order, um, orderly environment. But also she's very hardworking and always wants to be on the go. Um, Joey, maybe the one that's most extroverted, he's very sociable, also, also always wants to be around people, gets quite um, lonely when he's not. Uh, but also people who are high in extroversion um, are always focused on seeking out goals and stimulation, okay, and always looking for rewards. Um, Rachel, maybe highest in agreeableness, particularly at the beginning, you know, people who are high in agreeableness bend to the will of others, okay, they're conflict avoidant, um, you know, she's particularly, uh, when she moves in with Monica, kind of does what Monica wants. And then neuroticism, you know, how likely you are to experience negative emotion, how likely you are to be irritated, but also people who are high in neuroticism experience negative emotion for a greater duration of time, okay, it's difficult for them to like flip a switch and then just become happy or enthusiastic when they're upset about something. It stays with them for a long time. And yeah. well, you know, if you've seen episodes like when somebody lost his sandwich, then you've seen, you know, him be pretty yeah. neurotic. <clears throat> okay, um, so I'll talk about the big five each now individually. Um, openness is the last discovered of the big five, mainly because it appears most weakly in factor analysis. So what I mean by that, if we you know look at the factor and the traits that um, load around it, the correlation between them is weaker in comparison to when we look at the other four factors. Um, it's also because of this, the broadest of these dimensions, okay? It contains more characteristics than the other four factors and is more broad in its meaning, therefore. And so it's difficult to conceptualize with just one word and is often difficult for people to grasp. And also because of this, it's gone by many names over the years, you know, because it's difficult to kind of pinpoint what exactly is at the core of what it is to be high in openness. So, you know, it's gone by names such as openness to experience, openness, intellect, unconventional, creativity. And uh, it's difficult to you know, grasp really what, what's at the center here. Now, it's difficult to characterize any of the five dimensions with one word, okay? Because they're not one word, they are five factors that contain multiple characteristics. But it's even more difficult with openness. <clears throat> Isaac was very against it being referred to as a personality trait because it corresponds with intelligence. And Isaac was very much of the um, opinion that intelligence is completely separate from personality. Um, so it does positively correlate with intelligence, creativity, creative achievements, and divergent thinking, novelty seeking. So, you know, people high in openness want to experience new things. They get a dopamine kick through experiencing novelty. They're drawn to that which is unconventional. Um, it corresponds with liberalism, especially on social issues as opposed to purely economic issues, for example. Um, and also corresponds with being in, um, an enjoyment for art fiction, particularly abstract art, but also more likely to engage in fantasy, um, more likely to you know, um, daydream, for example, and use one's imagination. Um, but also negatively corresponds to a need for cognitive closure. So people 
low in openness, for example, might be bothered when there's an open-ended ending to a movie or a um, TV show or a book, where someone higher in openness is more uh, okay with a kind of ambiguous ending. <clears throat> Um, now, I'll get to this after, but openness can be broken down into two main aspects, okay, those that are to do with openness to experience, uh, which is to do with wanting to experience diversity, and then those that are to do with intellect, which are to do with enjoying intellectual pursuits and, um, you know, trying to understand something as much as you can, because people high in openness, you know, always want to understand the why behind something, they want to understand the greater meaning, they're drawn to the greater, bigger picture. Um, but, you know, if we break it down into the aspects, then there's differences in terms of what correlates with them. So, for example, um, when we look at intelligence, the intellect aspects of openness corresponds with every type of intelligence, including the general um, intelligence factor, G factor, uh, but also nonverbal intelligence, verbal intelligence, um, whereas the openness to experience aspect only correlates with nonverbal intelligence, no other type of intelligence. And you know, if we look at the aspect level again, then social liberalism corresponds to the openness to experience aspect, but not the intellect aspect. There's no relationship there. <laughs> and it negatively correlates with being dogmatic and a whole range of ways of describing prejudices. So it negatively correlates with ageism, transphobia, um, anti feminism, um, um, Xenophobia, a fear of strangers, um, and a whole range of other prejudices that have been um, looked at. <clears throat> so, you know, also people high in openness, you know, they enjoy metaphors and they can think abstractly. Um, and, you know, to demonstrate that people who have autism, not always, but typically score very near the bottom of the distribution in openness. And a big part of what it means to have autism is a difficulty thinking abstractly. Um, and so, for example, in one study, children who had autism and children who didn't were all asked to draw a picture of a house. And the children who didn't have autism pretty much all drew the same picture, okay, with some abstract idea of a house that's not actually really any house that's seen. It's just what you think of when you think of house. And it's this kind of perfect rectangle that has, you know, two perfect square windows and then two perfect square windows on top of it. Uh, you know, a chimney, even though most houses nowadays don't have chimneys and then a perfect rect rectangle roof. Um, so they weren't really thinking about house in particular, okay, they were just thinking of what, um, what you know, what a house is, but they all had some shared um, mental imagery of it. Whereas for the children with autism, their pictures were all completely different because they drew a particular house, usually their own house, and they had to think of it exactly and then try to replicate it exactly. Um, okay, so, you know, a part of, therefore, it, uh, of being high in openness is better abstract thinking. <coughs> And um, which, you know, there's overlap here between the big five and the um, the dichotomies we looked at in the Mars brick. And um, so that's the thinking, feeling dimension, the sensor, intuition uh, dimension, extroversion, introversion, and then judging, perceiving. And uh, so based upon what I've said, what, what do you think the finding is? Which of these dimensions do you think correlates with openness? Intuitive. intuitive and setting yeah yeah so uh, people who are high in openness are typically intuitive types people who are low in openness are typically sensing types it's a strong correlation remember i told you the study in which intuitive types and sensor types can look to the same picture it's a picture of a forest that has you no know, strange objects in it the intuitive types gave some big picture answer like an, an enchanted forest is what we saw but, you know, quite often they can be accused of you know, focusing too much on the forest, for example, and not looking at the tree, whereas the sensor types were listing exactly what you saw. So again, part of um, how this is overlapping is that high openness is looking at the bigger picture and abstract details, whereas low openness corresponds to wanting to deal with practical matters, the here and now, um, being more present oriented and dealing with particular specific facts and details. <clears throat> Okay, and um, conscientiousness, you know, being socially disciplined, um, but also a lot of these traits can be broken down into two aspects, orderliness and industriousness. 
So you know, we know a fair bit about orderliness. It corresponds with disgust sensitivity. You know, so how experience, how likely you are to experience disgust when you see a revolting sight or a revolting smell. Um, but also it corresponds to how disgusted you are with moral transgressions as well. And, you know, people who are higher in conscientiousness are more obedient to society's rules. And when they're jury members, they're more demanding of more harsher punishments, more pro the death penalty. Um, and it's not too surprising that, you know, if someone is more socially responsible, more likely to obey rules themselves, they then demand more of a punishment when people don't obey the rules in comparison to people who are less likely to follow the rules than them. And we know much less about industriousness, okay? Industriousness is hard really to define, but the best way of looking at it is um, finding inactivity to be adverse, okay? They find it actually uncomfortable to not be doing something. They always want to be on the move. They always want to be occupied. They always want to be doing something. And it's sort of a willingness to sacrifice the present for the future, okay? It's okay to be hardworking now because you want the future to be better. Uh, now, th there's no dopamine activation that corresponds with conscientiousness, okay? So it's not the case that being industrious gives someone positivity. It's not the case that it, they're more likely to experience enthusiasm when they ex, um, reach their goal, okay? They're more goal-orientated, they're more likely to have goals, but it's not the case that they experience more positivity from this. So therefore, it's difficult to explain why someone would be industrious, okay? Other than the fact that they're trying to dampen the negative emotion that comes from inactivity, because they do experience more guilt when they don't use their time productively, okay? <laughs> And so industriousness really is a mystery in many ways. There's no great theoretical model of it in terms of why someone would be industrious, okay? There's good explanations for the other big five dimensions and the other aspects, okay? You know, why would someone be orderly and high in disgust sensitivity? Well, to avoid contaminated food would be the obvious evolutionary explanation. And then we can come to other evolutionary explanations for the other dimensions as well. Uh, there's no neuropsychological model of industriousness, okay? And we'll talk about this more in the biological chapter, but each of the aspects other than industriousness have some sort of biological or neurological correlates that goes with it. Um, you know, there's certain brain structures that are in higher volume on average when someone is higher in agreeableness. And, um, you know, aspects of um, neuroticism correspond to a more active behavioral inhibition system or a more active fight flight system. Um, and um, extraversion corresponds to dopamine respect receptors and openness corresponds to uh, um, not a dopamine receptor that responds to novelty. Um, but there's no neuropsychological model or any neurological correlate that comes with industriousness. Okay, There was a 2010 paper that said that there was or found that there was a correlation between prefrontal cortex and activation and industriousness. But every paper since has failed to replicate the findings, so it doesn't seem to be that that's actually the case. There doesn't seem to be an association between those two things. Um, and then there's no psychological model of it either, okay? It's difficult for people to explain what they're experiencing when they're being industrious or why they're being industrious. You know, we can interview people over why they're being agreeable or why they're being extroverted or why they're being anxious or what it feels like to be anxious, what it feels like to be depressed. But in terms of asking someone why they're being industrious, it's kind of just because they always want to be busy. There's not really much depth to their explanations. So we don't really have a great model for it, for it from a psychological point of view either. And then there's no pharma, um, pharmacological model either. There's no medication we can use to increase someone's industriousness. Um, the closest would be ADHD medication, right, which keeps people focused on a particular task, but that's not the same as industriousness. <clears throat> And a big part of the problem also is that it can't be measured with tasks, okay? Many, many researchers have tried to come up with experiments that can measure industriousness and all have failed. Um, you know, we can come up with cooperation tasks, for example, to measure experimentally agreeableness. We can measure orderliness and discuss sensitivity by, you know, um, seeing how sensitive people are to disgusting stimuli. Um, and, and the other aspects as well, the big five also can be experimentally tested. There's no experiment that can test industriousness. You know, researchers have tried using techniques such as giving participants a difficult, challenging task and then seeing if they persist with it and if they have the motivation to continue. 
But intelligence is clearly a confounding variable here because the more intelligent someone is, the more uh, the greater ease with which they'll be able to complete the task that they're trying to complete. Uh, so researchers often, therefore, by accident, measure intelligence when they meant to measure industriousness. It positively correlates with school work, school performance, school success. I told you again and again, the correlation between exam scores and conscientiousness is 0.4, so it accounts for 16% of the variance. You know, because people who are higher in conscientiousness, again, more likely to experience guilt when they aren't using their time productively, so more likely to be studying or putting together a planner or you know whatever is going to help them study, more likely to be doing assignment, assignments on time and, and so on. Um, also, um, and in fact, in some cases, it, it accounts for more of the variance than intelligence. Um, it will, of course, depend upon how difficult the class is, right? In a more difficult class, intelligence probably explains more of the variance. In a less difficult class, conscientiousness probably explains more of the variance. And it will depend upon the sample as well. If the sample is more similar in intelligence, then conscientiousness will explain more of the variance. Um, it accounts for better job performance, being likely to have job um, promotions, and um, better um, financial success. It's one of the best personality predictors of um, getting a better salary. Uh, it's one of the best predictors of success in the military. It positively corresponds with happiness and social conservatism, and feelings of disgust and a proneness of guilt if you're not using your term, you're, you're, you're using your time productively. Um, openness is a better predictor of conservatism, low openness, um, because high openness predicts liberalism. Um, so if someone is high in both conscientiousness and openness, then statistically speaking, they'd be more likely to be liberal or left-leaning than conservative. Um, it negatively correlates with neuroticism, probably because they're more likely to take control over their environments, okay, and so we'll have more control over the variables that might lead to one being depressed or anxious. And then it negatively cor corresponds with a whole range of other risky behaviors, okay. It negatively correlates with risky sexual behavior, negatively correlates with adultery, negatively correlates with driving over the speed limits, negatively correlates with other risk-taking behaviors, negatively correlates with gambling, excess drinking, taking drugs, negatively correlates with swearing or telling dirty jokes or finding dirty jokes funny or talking about sexual encounters with friends, and negatively, negatively correlates with how likely you are to walk around the house naked as well. So sometimes psychologists measure unusual stuff. Um, so, okay. And then it also um, positively correlates with a whole range of satisfactory as well. People higher in conscientiousness are more likely to be satisfied with their life, more likely to be satisfied with their job, more likely to be higher in physical health, they're more likely to take care of the health, watch what they eat, and avoid um, harmful um, healthy behaviors like smoking. Um, which of the Myers Briggs dichotomies do you think this overlaps with? Yeah, judging proceeding. So people higher in consciousness are more likely to be judges, those um, lower are more likely to be deceivers. So again, the overlap being that those higher in consciousness are more future oriented and more appreciative of stability. Um, we, we, we will cover the association in more detail later in the course between politics and personality. Um, but I, I can say this now also, um, you know, there are five main moral foundations. Yeah. What did you say, like, correlates with, like, high conscientiousness and judging? And judging. Okay. Yeah, and then perceiving would be low conscientiousness. Yeah. Okay, there's five moral foundations that people often use to determine if something is moral or an action has, you know, breached a moral rule. Um, <coughs> whether it's fair, uh, whether it's harmful to others, whether it's disloyal to the group, whether it's being disobedient to authority. 
and then whether it's um, not maintaining that which is sacred or pure. And um, people low in conscientiousness are typically less likely to value those last three. They will typically only look at whether something is fair or harmful to others when determining if something is um, determining if something is moral or not. Whereas those higher in conscientiousness are more likely to look at all five. Okay, so not only is it harmful, not only uh, is it fair. But also, is it being loyal or disloyal to the group? Is it being obedient or is it being authority? And then also, is it maintaining that which is sacred and pure or, or not? Any questions so far on the first two factors? Um, and then extroversion, of course. Um, we talked about with Jung, but he talked about how one orientates themselves are they orientated inward are they energized by inward activity or are they orientated outwards and energized through interacting with the world and but we're broadening the definition here okay so yes it can be characterized in terms of how sociable and outgoing one is but also how um, socially assertive one is and also um, to what extent one experiences positive emotions as well so extroversion corresponds with um, happiness, reward, sensitivity, more dopamine receptors, um, and then overall greater enthusiasm and positivity as well. So, you know, if I use the term introverts or introversion, that's not a separate dimension in this model, right? That's just those who score low in extroversion. Okay, it's not like with Jung, in which introversion was its own category and extroversion was its own category. In this model, introversion is just the absence of extroversion. It's not actually, it's not actually anything itself. Okay. So it would just be someone who scores alone in extroversion. So an introvert, just to be clear, isn't necessarily more likely to experience negative emotion, okay? Because negative emotion is to do with neuroticism, not to do with extroversion. Um, and so an introvert, for example, who was low in neuroticism would be not likely to experience either negative or positive emotion. The mood would be more likely to be neutral most of the time. Okay. <clears throat> and it positively correlates with a higher number of sexual partners having children at a younger age, processing your thoughts externally, and seeking out time for socializing and having a higher number of friends as well. <clears throat> so as we're going to see, extroversion is a very stable dimension across the lifespan, okay? And a powerful impact on behavior as well. It's difficult for extroverts to act like introverts or introverts to act like extroverts, okay? For introverts to fake enthusiasm, for example, if they're not actually enthusiastic. Um, you know, certainly people can increase their skill set. You know, introverts and extroverts can learn from one another, and introverts can learn to be more comfortable in large group settings. But one's natural predisposition is unlikely to change in this dimension. <clears throat> Okay, agreeableness, how cooperative, compliant, self-sacrificing you are. Um, but these traits can really be loaded onto two aspects as uh, politeness and compassion. Um, politeness to do with you know what not wanting to upset people, um, and then compassion to do with being altruistic and, and high in empathy. Um, you know, so first of all, it's a um, negative predictor of income. So people higher in agreeableness uh, typically get paid less. Um, probably two main reasons. First of all, they're less likely to ask for a pay rise in the first place. And then second of all, if there's a negotiation involved in getting a pay rise, they're less likely to be competent negotiators. Because if you're high in agreeableness, confrontation is physically uncomfortable for you, okay? You like to maintain peace and make sure other people are um, content. And any sort of conflict is uncomfortable for you. Uh, and people are their primary motivator, okay? They're self-sacrificing and always thinking about what they can do for others. So much so that they might not actually know what they want themselves because they're not used to thinking about what they want. They're more used to using what other people want as their decision-making um, criteria. And uh, But also, if you ask someone whose most dominant trait is agreeableness to talk about themselves, 
will typically talk about themselves in relationship to other people. So the fact that you know they're a mother or they're a boyfriend or whatever it is, but they'll talk about the close relationships and how that defines them. Whereas, for example, someone whose dominant trait was openness would be more likely to talk about that which they're intrinsically interested in in terms of how that defines them. <laughs> um, low agreeableness, the best personality predictor of going to prison, and correlates with um, a number of um, personality or antisocial personality disorders that also predict criminal behavior. So narcissism, psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder. Um, we're talking here only at the extreme low end, right? It's not the case that if you're just slightly below average, then you're going to be more likely to go to prison. We're talking about only getting predictive power when we look at the very low end of the distribution. Because, you know, just to be clear, all of these five um, traits or dimensions, right? Normal distributions, most people are in the middle, you people are at the extremes, um, and they're not types. It's not the case that there's an agreeable type or an extrovert type. Everyone has five separate scores on five separate dimensions. And males typically score lower in agreeableness than women. It's the largest um, difference in terms of the five dimensions. The difference on the distribution is half a standard of deviation. What that means is if I picked a random male and a random female, I asked you both to complete the big five questionnaire and I bet money on the uh, women scoring higher in agreeableness, I would be right 60% of the time and I would be wrong 40% of the time. So it's not an overwhelming difference, but it's a reliable difference that's found again across studies. <clears throat> okay, um, and then lastly, neuroticism. So how likely you are to experience negative emotion. And like I say, these negative emotions correlate with one another. So it positively correlates with moodiness, anxiety, anger, depression, envy, fear, frustration, guilt, jealousy, loneliness, and worry. And like I say, the one exception is disgust, which loads on to conscientiousness. <clears throat> and those who are higher in neuroticism, more likely to have lower self-esteem, more likely to be self-conscious, always worrying that people don't like them. Um, they typically undervalue themselves and underestimate how people will perceive them. Um, and they um, are quite often shy. So shy is an overlap between low extroversion and high neuroticism, right? It's a fear of social judgment. It's not to be um, confused with purely um, introversion. <clears throat> so, you know, if we ask people in the office, for example, um, you know, to score how much people like them. You know, people lower in um, neuroticism are more likely to have a more accurate picture of how liked they are, whereas people higher in neuroticism will typically under-report how liked they are. And it negatively correlates with um, happiness, well-being, health, including mental health, okay? So it's a predictor of a number of mood disorders or mental pathologies like clinical depression, or anxiety disorders, but also physical health as well. Um, you know, if given, for example, a diagnosis by a doctor, people higher in neuroticism are less likely to follow the doctor's advice, less likely to seek out social support. They're less, they're more likely to experience denial, and so won't then consider that they actually have something really wrong with them and try to understand it and what they can do about it. <clears throat> Any any questions there on the big five dimensions? Um, okay, so Costa McCree came up with the questionnaire. Like I say, popular because of its high reliability, internally consistent, stable over time. Uh, but also it splits the five factors each into six facets. Okay, so this is recognizing that. These are five complicated dimensions, okay, that are made up of multiple characteristics and the facets or ways of further describing this. Um, but actually what we find is there's no real benefit to measuring the facets because they on their own do not give any better predictive power than the factor on its own does. So for example, I said, 
you know, openness um, correlates with social liberalism, and social liberalism also correlates with several other facets, but there's no particular facet that it's more strongly associated with than its association with just the general factor. <clears throat> so unless maybe you're doing a particular study in which there is a specific reason for looking at a particular facet, there's little benefit to looking at the association between the facets and particular behaviors. Um, also, there's no empirical or theoretical reason as to why there is six facets for each of these. There isn't six sub-factors that emerge in factor analysis, okay? And it's cost and McRae when asked why six facets said they had to draw the line somewhere, but, you know, in theory, it could be more, it could be less. But there's no real theoretical reason or empirical demonstration of why there would be six facets. <clears throat> Whereas more recently, the big five aspects scale is a questionnaire that splits the, the big five into two aspects each. And so there's 10 aspects being measured. And these can be empirically demonstrated, okay, if we factor analysis, there are two sub factors that appear within the five factors through factor analysis. So in openness, there is two subgroups, those that are more loaded together and can be called openness to experience, and then those more loaded together that can be called intellect. Um, and also, as, uh, as I'll talk about when we do the biological chapter, there's separate biological correlates as well for each of these aspects. So for example, withdrawal correlates with a more active behavioral inhibition system, which is when you have a reward or goal in mind but you're afraid of consequences and so don't seek out um, the goal. Um, you know, so wanting to ask someone on a date, for example, but being too fixated on rejection, so not going ahead with the behavior. Um, whereas volatility uh, is to do with being combative and defensive and irritable um, and, um, and correlates with a more active flight fight system with the um, fight flight system tilting towards fight mm -hmm. responses. Um, so there's separate biological correlates as well for each of the aspects. Um, and furthermore, they have predictive power um, on their own, okay? So we can predict particular behaviours and outcomes that can't be predicted at the factor level. So for example, agreeableness is not a good predictor on its own of political orientations, but at the aspect level, politeness predicts more endorsement for right-leaning policies and compassion predicts more endorsement for left-leaning policies. <clears throat> um, and then with openness, openness to experience correlates with um, non-verbal intelligence but no other type of intelligence, whereas intellect correlates with um, general IQ, non-verbal intelligence, verbal intelligence. So we're getting stronger predictors by looking at the aspect level. And so, Openness to experiences, that which is to do with novelty seeking and being um, drawn to the unconventional, you know, wanting to experience diversity and being more likely to, you know, try a new food item rather than sticking for that which is familiar. Whereas intellect is the part that's to do with interest in intellectually stimulating um, activities such as, you know, reading or talking about ideas. Um, conscientiousness, we've talked about orderliness. You know, orderly environment, discuss sensitivity, industriousness, hard working, always on the go, and um, guilt if you're not using your time productively. And extroversion can be broken down into two aspects enthusiasm and sensitiveness, which is kind of the difference between wanting a reward and liking a reward. Okay, the both are to do with dopamine activation, and assertiveness is you know, willingness to take control of a social situation, go for what you want. Whereas enthusiasm then is more to do with positivity when things are going well and experiencing enthusiasm. And agreeableness, we talked about politeness, you know, um, compliance, not wanting to upset, and compassion, um, altruism, empathy. And then neuroticism, withdrawal is to do with shyness, depression, wanting to keep away from social situations, where volatility is to do with how irritable you are how defensive and combative you are during um, um, conversations or debates or arguments. <clears throat> Any questions on the 10 aspects? Are they all clear on the definitions? Yes. 
And then one of the major strengths also of Big Five is that there are um, actual outcomes that we can predict, actual behaviors that reliably correlate with people's scores on the Big Five. So like I said, conscientiousness and exam scores is one. Um, but there is multiple, okay, and are found again and again um, from study to study. Now, we can look at the association between one personality dimension and a behavior, but we get even stronger of a correlation when we look at numerous personality traits, okay, which isn't too surprising because, you know, you're likely made up of multiple motivations, right, and you have various dispositions, it's not just that you're controlled by one dimension, <laughs> so, you know, for example, how likely you are to volunteer, what's that most strongly associated with? Agreeableness, okay, because if you're not high in agreeableness, you're not very likely to care about other people, whereas if you're high, then you're higher in compassion. But we get even stronger of a predictor if we bring extroversion into the mix as well. Because if you're high in agreeableness, but extremely introverted, then you might not volunteer because you don't want the kind of socializing element of it. So, you know, who is most likely to volunteer in terms of big five makeup? Those who are high in both extroversion and agreeableness. You know, good grades, like I said, predicted by high conscientiousness, but the association between personality and grades is even greater when we bring neuroticism into the mix as well, because low neuroticism predicts then being less anxious when sitting a test or maybe getting less freaked out if there's a question you can't uh, think of the answer to straight away. Uh, you no know, risky sexual behaviour, yes, predicted by low conscientiousness, but again, predicted by other factors as well to a less degree. So who is most likely to engage in this behavior are those that are high in extroversion, high in neuroticism, low conscientiousness, and low in agreeableness. Alcohol consumption, both high extroversion, low conscientiousness. Gambling, yes, predicted by low conscientiousness, but even more likely when high neuroticism is also present. Um, declining to become a union member, if low in extroversion and low in neuroticism. How likely you are to forgive if you're high in agreeableness and low in neuroticism. And then how effective of a leader you are perceived to be high extroversion, high agreeableness, high conscientiousness, low neuroticism. And then you can think of you know, various outcomes, various behaviors that might be uh, predicted by various makeups of the big five. Um, now, you know, these are examples of outcomes or behaviors that can be predicted by one factor, it's just the case that the association is even stronger when we bring multiple factors into the mix. But there are some behaviors that can't be predicted by any dimension on their own. They can be predicted um, by some you know, various makeup. So for example, during the pandemic, there were several studies looking at the personality association and um, following the rules that were in place. So for example, how likely someone was to follow social distancing rules and on their own, none of the big fives, five dimensions predicted um, this. But two dimensions together did. If someone, if someone was high in conscientiousness and high in neuroticism, then together that predicted being more likely to follow social distancing rules. But on their own, neither was a significant predictor. <clears throat> Okay, um, so you know these five dimensions are so comprehensive that some researchers have said, let's just get away and put aside the labels, okay? Maybe just give them Roman numerals instead, factor one, factor two, all the way to factor five, because any word is going to be misleading. Now I use the word agreeableness and someone thinks they know what that means, but actually they don't because it contains a great deal of characteristics, okay? Someone can be agreeable in some ways, but not in others. They can be compassionate and altruistic, but maybe not so polite, for example. Um, so any one word is going to oversimplify the issue and be potentially misleading. <clears throat> um, so yeah, each of these dimensions are not one thing. They're a collection of many things that have something in common. A good degree of cross-cultural support. Um, another big plus they seem to exist across cultures. Um, various countries listed here. And then in 2005, a further 51 countries. There have been some, not many, some studies that haven't been able to replicate the big five exactly, such as this study looking at a sample of um, 
natives in a society in the Amazon. It's usually openness that appears most weakly and so might be the most difficult to find in factor analysis in these studies. But even though these five factors seem to exist, at least to some extent, the importance that's placed upon them will sometimes differ from culture to culture. So Japan, for example, they place more importance on conscientiousness than any of the other four dimensions. Um, in Hong Kong and in India, more importance on agreeableness than the other four. Um, in Australia, more importance on extroversion and agreeableness. Um, but overall, what the kind of main finding is, is that Europeans and Americans, so you know, Westerners in more individualistic societies, tend to be higher in openness, higher in extroversion, and lower in agreeableness in comparison to African countries or Asian countries or more collectivist countries, which are typically higher in agreeableness than other parts of the world. So, you know, not too surprising, right? More individualistic countries are, you know, taught to be more uh, focused on the self and doing the best that you can do, whereas more collectivist societies are more focused on what you can do for the community and thinking about the family or the country or the bigger um, community. <clears throat> and also the they somewhat vary depending upon location here in the US as well. Uh, for example, agreeableness is found at its highest here in the southeastern states, um, whereas openness is at its highest around particular cities such as Denver, LA, Miami, New York, Portland, San Antonio, Seattle, and San Francisco. Uh, so just a visual illustration of this, you can see the hot spots of these. Um, the redder it is, obviously, the, um, the greater the um the greater the finding is of this particular trend so openness around south Carol california um new york city um, agreeableness particularly here in the southeast and then you can see other somewhat hot spots as well such as more neuroticism in the northeast <clears throat> hey, Um, another study that also found the same findings. Um, bear in mind that this is just, you know, this is looking at um, the top states all the way down to the bottom states. So, you know, some of these look very different, but actually um, the variation isn't great. Okay, it's just obviously there's some state, states at the top and some states at the bottom because we're ranking them all in terms of which are highest in agreeableness in this case. But the greater the green, then the, the highest. Um, Agreeableness. So again, you can see the southeastern states and some northern states are the ones that are highest in agreeableness. <clears throat> uh, openness again at its highest on the Pacific coast and around Colorado and around New York City. Uh, neuroticism again around its highest in the northeast and then also some more southern states. Um, conscientiousness doesn't vary greatly, but mostly. At its highest in some southeast states and in the middle states. And then extroversion again doesn't vary greatly, but seems to be the middle states again are at the highest in extroversion most years. Okay, and then also there are some sex differences found between the five dimensions. And again, these are found across cultures. In general, women tend to score higher on agreeableness. Um, this is the biggest one. Also extroversion, but the difference in extroversion is only slight, but it's one that's found reliably across samples, across cultures, across time. Um, neuroticism, but the difference in neuroticism only appears in adolescence. Okay? In any marker of it, such as self-esteem, there is no significant difference between boys and girls, for example, until they get to the teenage years. And then there is a significant difference between males and females that's then stable for the rest of the lifestyle. Um, the difference in conscientiousness cancels itself out. So there's no overall difference, but if we look at it in terms of the aspects, women typically score higher in orderliness and men typically score higher in industriousness. <clears throat> now, these differences are at, its, are at their highest in more wealthy 
egalitarian countries, meaning those that are more gender equal in comparison to countries that are less gender equal, which is not what psychologists expected to find. Okay, They expected that the more egalitarian countries would have smaller sex differences in terms of personality, and the least egalitarian countries would have the largest differences. But the opposite finding is found again and again, to the point now that we have hundreds of thousands of participants in these studies demonstrating this finding. <clears throat> Then, you know, so this is just some illustrations of this neuroticism being measured from 19 until 69. The red line female participants, the blue male, blue line male participants. And so, you know, across adulthood, neuroticism, significant difference, extroversion, very slight difference, openness, slight difference, and agreeableness, fairly large difference. And, you know, like I said, it's half a standard deviation. So that you know, if I bet with the women was higher, I'd be right 60% of the time, around 40%. So it's not overwhelming. There's still obviously variation within the sexes. Um, no significant difference really in conscientiousness. But just to give you a comparison, you know, these are all familiar, I assume, with the kind of average differences in heights between males and females. This is what the distributions look like, okay, in terms of the differences between the average. So the orange one is the distribution of female participants in height. Blue is male participants in height. And then you can see the difference between the averages. So you know, this is the difference in neuroticism. It's much less um, than the difference in height. And the difference in extroversion is even smaller Okay, in terms of the difference. So we're not talking about an overwhelming difference, but we're talking about a difference that's found reliably. <clears throat> So self-esteem, a good marker for neuroticism. In this case, high self-esteem would correspond to low neuroticism. Um, no differences between males and females really that's significant in elementary school and middle, middle school. But by the time of high school, then there becomes a more significant difference and then that continues. And I will talk more about this when we talk about the biological chapter, okay, because there's different explanations for this. But just to illustrate what I said before, this is um, looking at the correlation between egalitarianism and the sex differences on average. So the gender equality index is a way of measuring how egalitarian a country is, and it ranks every country from most egalitarian to least. So those at the very highest are Norway and Sweden, uh, who have put more effort into um, gender equality than any other country. And this also measures, for example, gender representation in politics and other decision making models. Uh, and then at the lowest end in terms of egalitarianism is India, South Korea. Um, and then on the x axis is the average difference in these countries between the personality traits on average. Okay. And actually, you know, what you can see is Netherlands is the one that's highest in terms of. Differences between sexes in the world. <coughs> you know, it's fairly high in egalitarianism. The Norway and Sweden are then the second highest in personality differences, even though they're the most egalitarian. And uh, where the country's lowest in egalitarianism or gender equality are the ones um, lower in overall sex differences. <coughs> And um, also what you may have seen is the um, big five change somewhat across the lifespan as well, okay? But, you know, there is a good degree of stability to them. Um, the meta-analysis by Brent Roberts is the best illustration of this. Um, but openness is the one that's most stable, okay? The, what, the one that's most stable over the lifespan, as is aspects or characteristics of extroversion. Um, such as enthusiasm, positivity, um, sociability. The one exception really is um, social assertiveness or social dominance. That's the one characteristic on extroversion that seems to increase on average across the lifespan. Um, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and emotional stability, which is the reverse of neuroticism, all also typically increase across the lifespan. 
maybe not too surprising, the older you get, the better you get at dealing with people, dealing with conflict, the better you get at staying fixed on your motivations and seeing them through, the better you get at dealing with your anxieties and your negative emotions. And so it's probably not too surprising that um, these findings are found across the lifespan. Whereas openness is to do with what you're intrinsically interested in, which might be harder um, and harder to change whether you experience a dopamine kick from novelty or not. And then, you know, most aspects of extroversion as well, you know, might be hard to change because it's a predisposition for whether you like your own company or whether you like the company of others and are energized by this or are exhausted by this. Um, aspects of extroversion, very stable. The exception being social dominance, which tends to increase as one gets older. Agreeableness tends to increase as one gets older. Conscientiousness um, stably or reliably increases as one gets older. As does emotional stability, well, kind of especially in young adulthood, and then kind of levels off. Uh, and then openness to experience is particularly stable. You know, it peaks around 20 young adulthood and um, mm -hmm. peaks again somewhat middle age and then dips once one is um, elderly, but, but mostly is pretty stable. <clears throat> yeah. So are these like longitudinal studies or are they like just in general what they see at each age group? They're mostly um, what they see in each age group. <clears throat> Any other questions? Anything on the gender differences or the stability or any of the big five dimensions? <clears throat> um, I'll just talk about one more thing then, um, which is Robert's social investment theory, which kind of accounts to explain why there might be changes across the lifespan. Um, that people typically become more agreeable, conscientiousness, and emotionally stable once they um, progress into the workplace, okay? They then have to have a routine, okay, which might be why they're more conscientious. They have to be more organized in terms of how they live their life. Um, they may also then be receiving feedback, understanding what's expected of them, which might lessen their anxieties. Um, and then you also have to deal with people and you know build relationships in the workplace, and so that might correspond with better agreeableness. Um, but also, you know, it depends upon your role, your identity. You know, maybe you know joining the military would increase your conscientiousness, for example, because you have to be more orderly in that environment. Um, but you know, other identities as well, such as becoming a parent, increases neuroticism, and um, you know. That can be, you know, stressful, but also it's kind of um, unclear initially on how to deal with this, right? Um, and the more ambiguous the situation is, that's typically when neuroticism might then come to the peak. <clears throat> but, you know, obviously what you choose to do with your life, what the roles you have, that's going to have some impact on how the big five might change or how they might manifest themselves. <clears throat> Okay, but you know, remember a big component of this theory was that these five factors are completely separate from one another, right? It's five separate factors that emerge from factor analysis and they have no bearing on each other. They're completely distinct. But in fact, what we've more recently come to realize is this isn't entirely true. Um, there is a small but reliable correlation that's positive between emotional stability, conscientiousness, and agreeableness, and then a small Again, small but po um, positive correlation between openness and extroversion that again is reliably found across samples and across studies. Um, so Colin D. Young, who we'll talk more about when we talk about biological arguments, has said that there's two kind of meta traits, okay? One called stability, which is um, encompassing emotional stability, agreeableness, and conscientiousness explaining why they're somewhat correlated with one another, which is the ability to maintain stability and avoid disruption in emotional, social, and motivational domains. And then plasticity is the other 
meta traits, okay, that encompasses openness and extroversion, to explore and engage flexibly with novelty. And now, interestingly, also, as we'll see, um, emotional stability, conscientiousness, and agreeableness are all associated with serotonin, which we'll talk more about when we talk about <coughs> biological arguments. And extroversion and openness are clearly linked to um, dopamine. So there's a clear um, distinction there as well between the kind of neurological correlates opposed to meta traits. Um, and then some researchers have argued that maybe there is even some general factor of personality, you know, that could be um, responsible for the connection between all of these traits. And certainly in one study, they looked at um, high extroversion. Participants who were high in extroversion were more likely to be higher in the other four traits in comparison to people who were lower. But generally, there's been good evidence that these two method traits are pretty distinct from one another, and there, there's no correlation between them. So overall, for example, the correlation between extroversion and emotional stability is basically zero, and the same is true for the other traits to do with stability and other traits to do with plasticity. There's little overlap there. <laughs> Um, okay, but you know, that's one possible criticism that's brought up that these five factors are not entirely distinct. And the other criticism that's often brought up is that they are missing traits, okay, that they're not fully um, capturing personality, that there might be personality traits that are not covered by the big five. Uh, so before I show you some um, that have been proposed by researchers, is there any off the top of your head that you might think aren't covered by the big five that you might think are... <laughs> Personality traits. No, so the big five seems to be pretty encompassing. Okay. Um, well, some researchers have proposed some traits that they think are missing from the big five. Yeah. Now, there is at least some degree of empirical evidence that shows some of these traits are somewhat correlated with the big five. And then some, you know, we might theoretically link, even if they haven't been empirically uh, demonstrated to be linked. But some do seem to be more um, distinct, but, you know, then the debate is if there is, if there is reason to call these personality traits. <laughs> the proponents of the big five are open to the idea of including other traits, okay? They're not saying that there is only five. They say if the evidence warrants it, uh, warrants it, then there could be additions to the Big Five. But so far, they haven't found any of the evidence compelling. So the proponents of the Big Five, as of now, are content that there is five dimensions only. But these are some of the um, you know, suggestions that are brought up by critics that think that the Big Five isn't encompassing. Um, manipulativeness, okay, or Machiavellianism, okay, which is one of the dark triad personality traits with psychotism and the narcissism that we will come back to when we talk about the kind of personality disorders and the kind of dark triad traits. And, you know, some overlap with the big five, you know, low agreeableness, for example, would correlate with higher manipulativeness. And this certainly doesn't account for all of the variants, okay? So at least not all of it is explained by the big five makeup. Honestly, again, um, correlates with agreeableness, but again, it's a small correlation, so not all of the variance is explained by the big five. So some um, critics have argued that this should be regarded as a separate trait. Um, sexiness or seductiveness, um, again, not a great deal of overlap with the big five, but if this is a personality trait, there's at least some correlation, for example, with extroversion. Um, thriftiness, I guess, kind of depends upon how you define it. But we're talking about being kind of more careful with money, then that's got some overlap with conscientiousness. But it's kind of, um, again, not a great correlation. So the debate there is maybe this is a distinct. Some have argued masculinity, femininity, but are these personality traits? I mean, I would say that they're more kind of generalizations over. Um, differences in averages that are found, but they can be explained by the big five, right? On average, 
um, female participants are higher in agreeableness. So maybe that's kind of overlapping with what's perceived as being femininity. Um, so I would say, you know, not personality traits explained by the big five, but some critics have thought differently. Um, egoism, again, some overlap with narcissism. Um, sense of humor. Now, this one hasn't been empirically um, demonstrated to be linked to the big five, but we already know, we've seen already that the big five has some impact on senses of humor, right? For example, um, those higher in conscientiousness are less likely to find dirty jokes funny. Those higher in agreeableness are probably going to find jokes at the expense of others less amusing, okay? Because they're more higher in empathy and compassion and find other people's upset to be upsetting for them as well. And if we're talking about this is just one trait, having a sense of humor versus not having a sense of humor, you know, I would argue that, you know, that's, again, probably overlapping with other characteristics, right? If someone doesn't have a sense of humor or is perceived as not having a sense of humor, then that's probably a symptom of maybe, you know, depression or maybe the fact that maybe they're ultra serious, which might be ultra conscientiousness. Um, risk taking, thrill seeking, and um, you know, certainly can be predicted with um, low conscientiousness, high extroversion. Okay, but again, all of the variances explained. Spirituality is certainly the one, and religiosity, if we include that, is not overlapping with the big five at all. Okay, it has zero correlation with the big five, and a lot of researchers have tried using various measurements to do this. Um, but, you know, the argument there then is spirituality and personality traits. You know, this would mean someone who isn't very tied to physical possessions and is more in touch with their, you know, spiritual side. And um, certainly there are um, places in the world in which, you know, people are more in touch with the spiritual side, but I would say that's more a product of culture. It's not so much the case that spirituality varies to such a great extent there that it might be described as a personality trait. To describe yourself when talking about your personality as being spiritual, from my perspective, seems to be you know quite a niche thing that's maybe observed in America, but certainly not in many other parts of the world. And again, there, if it's such a niche, then is it really more to do with one's lifestyle or is it a personality trait? Again, you know, there's debate there. But it certainly doesn't seem to be tied to the big five. And then one other proposition is how snobby a person is. I mean, if one is snobby, the way in which they express this will be somewhat overlapping with the big five. Okay, if someone higher in agreeableness, for example, wouldn't want to offend people and would want to maintain kind of the, the peace around them. But, you know, even if they have thoughts then to do with snobby initiatives, I would say that's more a consequence of previous experiences, right, and what you're kind of used to, but I don't know, maybe that could be considered a personality trait, but that, again, doesn't seem to be linked to the big five, if it is. <clears throat> the, the one that <laughs> argues most consistently is honesty slash humility. Various researchers have found that this only, to a small extent, correlates with agreeableness and so is relatively distinct. So much so that the hexaco model um, has been developed, which has six dimensions then. Okay, and there's questionnaires just like there are for the big five to measure this. Um, so this would just be honesty slash humility, and then still um, extroversion, um, emotional stability, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. Um, but like I say, it does overlap with, with agreeableness, at least to some extent, in both English speaking studies, French speaking studies, Korean speaking studies. Um, but the, the variance that's explained is relatively small. So there is debate on whether this is a sixth dimension or not. Like I say, these researchers have argued that spirituality would be a better sixth dimension if, if there is to be a sixth dimension. McDonald's try 11 different ways of measuring spirituality in various samples, and all of the results found that there is zero correlation with the big five. And then one other criticism that was 
the, the, yeah. or at least was brought up, is that you know the big five is um, being developed from looking at adjectives that we use to describe differences in people. But you know, adjectives aren't the only words we use to describe people, and so some researchers said that maybe the big five was therefore missing out on important characteristics of personality. So one researcher um, tried to kind of put this argument to bed by doing um, a questionnaire using nouns that might be used to describe people's personality and then undergoing this through factor analysis. And I think the results quite clearly show that um, these aren't as useful ways of describing differences between people as in terms of the adjectives. So um, there was eight factors that emerged from factor analysis. Those to do with being a dummy moron twit, which the researcher called um, dumbbell is the name of the factor. Um, those to do with being a genius or an artist or a philosopher. Those to do with being a bolster or a critic. Those to do with being a lawbreaker, drunk, rebel. Those to do with being a class clown, a good comedian, a joker. <clears throat> Okay, so to evaluate the big five, we've seen it's highly replicable. Okay, again, from study to study, sample to sample, measurement to measurement, these five factors are emerging through factor analysis, even using questionnaires not designed to measure the big five, even using just one word items. And um, there's evidence that they exist across cultures. There is biological and evolutionary support. So, again, we have a week on this, but. Um, you know, there's neurological correlates with the big five. There's also evolutionary arguments for why the five factors exist and why there's variation in the, each of those big five. Um, the support of factor analysis, that there's real life applications that we can predict actual outcomes based upon the big five. And these have applications in various fields, such as in health, that those higher in conscientiousness are more likely to die and take care of what they eat. Um, those higher in neuroticism are more prone to mental pathologies. Um, but also, as we'll go on to see in, for example, um, uh, the workplace and in forensic psychology, okay, so for example, we can use the big five somewhat to predict how jurors might behave. So those higher in conscientiousness are typically more demanding of a harsher sentence. Um, and also somewhat with how witnesses will behave or be perceived as well. Um, that they're generally stable and that they can be measured at even a very young age and then are still relatively stable. And there's some criticisms that some of these traits somewhat overlap or correlate, so maybe they're not entirely five distinct factors. And some evidence for missing traits, at least according to some critics, it's not based upon any theory, okay? There's no theoretical reason as to why these are the five fundamental personality traits or that there are only five. It's just the case that they emerged through factor analysis. Openness is weaker in factor analysis than the others. And then the evidence for conscientiousness, but particularly industriousness, is somewhat of a mystery in terms of its neuropsychological origins and the, you know, the psychological model for it that we just didn't have. <clears throat> So the big five is mostly on the nature side of things, arguing that personality is mostly determined from an early age and that it's mostly stable across the lifespan. You know, so I hope you've seen that you know, when we talk about a personality trait, it's, it's, it's quite broad in terms of the definition, in terms of what it means. So there's various ways in which we could describe what a trait is, right? We can describe it as a sub-personality, or as a, you know, a frame of reference, meaning that you know, if you're higher in extroversion, for example, you're you know, looking for ways, into, ways to socialize and you know, you're wanting to capitalize on niches based upon the skill set that you have. So if you're high in extroversion, for example, you're going to perhaps enjoy a job in which there's constant social demand, such as in sales, whereas if you're an introvert, for example, then this will be exhausting for you and maybe not a career that you would like. But also domains of competence or skill sets. Um, 
Again, that those higher in extroversion will be more energized by being around people, that those higher in agreeableness will be more in touch with other people's feelings. And so might be better kind of kind of reading what people want in a given situation. <coughs> um, but again, it's the case that people can increase their skill set or increase their domain of competence, right? So that they can learn from others and people can learn to be more agreeable or learn to be more comfortable in large um, groups. Um, systems of value. Again, do you value being around people or do you value harmony amongst the people close to you? Or do you value hard work and kind of being motivated and uh, fixated on a task? <clears throat> Modes of perception. So if you're higher in neuroticism, remember you're more likely to be uh, perceptive of potential cues of punishment. Okay, you're more likely then to respond negatively and perceive perhaps social threats, whereas someone lower in neuroticism might not perceive things the same way. Patterns of behavior, so acting as conscientious or acting as agreeable. Um, and then stable motivations as well, right? So if you're high in openness, you're motivated to pursue that which you're intrinsically interested in, that which is novel and that which gives you a dopamine kick. And that's what you want to talk about in conversations as well, the ideas that you're excited by and that you're interested in. If you're high in agreeableness, then you're motivated by making sure that people you care about are um, experiencing positive emotion. And so you're motivated by trying to not, you know, not disrupt things by being um, by being argumentative. Instead, to try to make sure everyone is happy and trying to be self-sacrificing. <clears throat> so, you know, there's various ways in which we could think about these, but they're more complicated than just, you know, what people might think of when they first hear the term traits. <clears throat> Is there any questions on what we've covered on the big five? So, you know, for the exam, make sure you're, you know, fully prepped on the complexity of the big five and, you know, all of the manifestations of them that I discussed, as well as the 10 aspects, okay, and the distinctions between, for example, industriousness and orderliness and the other aspects of the big five. Um, as well as then, you know, the evidence that we've looked at in support of it. <clears throat> 